year is 1922. The world's in recovery from a bout of global conflict, though you might say remission will be short-lived. Mania, comorbid with other symptoms of syphilis, like fever dreams, begins to breed within the nations of the world. Eliot, T.S. Eliot, creates with the wasteland a glorious revolution in poetry. Certainly, Eliot's mind was a vast labyrinthine echo chamber. The connections in the wasteland between the narrator's emotional paralysis and the state of shell-shocked soldiers returning from the First World War is implicit. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess. For you know only a heap of broken images. What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? The dead tree from no man, shelter. you cannot say, the or get. No For you know only a heap of and broken dry images. Stone, the no sound of and the dead tree gives no shelter. The cricket, no relief. And the dry stone, no sound of only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in. Please welcome to the stage the studio head and directors of Kojima Production, Hideo Kojima. Twenty-six years ago, when I first started working on this franchise, games had no story. So I decided to put story into games. For Metal Gear, I wanted to introduce as much story as possible through cutscenes. It was an action game, it was not supposed to have story. This is what made the Metal Gear franchise up to this point. These days, you have a lot of games that are like movies, you know, linear games you play for 10 hours. I think there's a situation where these story-driven games have become kind of consumable. A while ago, when it was the era of the Famicom or the NES, the arcade game, these were games you would keep going back to because each time you would get something different. This replay value, this feeling that makes you come back again and again, is fundamental to games. With MGS5, I'm trying something new, something I haven't even heard of in the games industry before. I can't talk much about it, but hopefully I'll be able to surprise a lot of people with it. More than just thinking about sensitive things, if we don't cross a line and make those attempts to really express what we want to express, games will only be games. If we don't try to go beyond that, we won't be able to achieve what movies or novels have achieved. That is, to try and go beyond what the original media was supposed to be. I didn't want to stay away from things that could be considered sensitive and censor what I originally wanted to convey. If we don't go that far, games will never be considered as culture. <laughs> The man uh, behind it, uh, or at least we thought behind it, was uh, Mr. Mogren, the head CEO of Moby Dick Studios, and it's, it's great to have you with us uh, here today, Mr. Mogren. Hi, Jeff. 
That's, it's great to see you again. It's only been a few weeks you. since we chatted. You look a little bit different, but uh, how was your flight over? Um, very tired. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a long, long flight yes. from Sweden. I, your uh, eyes, it seems like they don't move very much. Could you uh, blink for me? Uh, yes, uh, wait a minute. Oh. Mr. Kojima, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> so here we are, Mr. Kojima, no more secrets. Uh, Cut to the fucking chase. Quiet's visual design is absolutely bloody shit in Metal Gear Solid 5, and the reasoning for it is even shitter. And Hideo Kojima was all, once you recognize the secret reason for her exposure, you will feel ashamed of your words and deeds. So now, those of us who've played the game know the secret reason, and I have to tell you, I ain't feeling too ashamed. Not for myself, anyway. The game achieved universal critical acclaim, averaging a 93 on Metacritic after a number of maxed out review scores. The game was reviewed by most mainstream critics at a publisher held review event, referred to as a boot camp, where reviewers had 40 hours to complete the game. And if you browse any specialized fan forums right now, you'll see opinions vastly differing from those of mainstream reviewers. MGS5 is also repetitive, unfinished, horribly paced, and the most unimaginative entry the series has seen. But overall, even the things it could have done to make the game worthwhile, it completely glosses over in favor of a story about this lame asshole and Kojima's new waifu. The one thing that could have made it worth the time would be elaborating on Zero as the main antagonist of the series. Because that major twist came out of nowhere and was extremely hard to buy to begin with. That your comedy sidekick from MGS3 turned out to be the mastermind behind the series. But no, it barely gets to touched upon. The relationship between Big Boss and Liquid? That could have been interesting. Nothing really happens though. The game doesn't even elaborate much on Big Boss's villainy. The minute to minute gameplay of the Phantom Pain feels like a chore, and that sucks because if there's one thing you gotta give Metal Gear as a series is how every moment something mad is happening. Everything you do in these games affected the main story, and it was just level after level after scene after scene after scenario after scenario of this stuff. Why am I blowing up these tanks? Why am I saving this guy? Why do I care about this intel? Nothing do with the story, Kaz just told me to do this stuff, I guess. It didn't feel like an ending, and the last few missions didn't feel like the game was coming to an end, and then all of a sudden the game ended. Ultimately though, the age and scale of this building meant there was no option but to close it down, and many say they're surprised it survived so long. But all the time it did, it was right at the heart of the community, not just providing medical care, but having fun and fundraising. The bed push was an annual event. With Scottish scientist James Maxwell. Maxwell's demon has continued to torment scientists for over a century. Blood dribbles down. We're on a submarine. Two sailors sit down and have a game of chess. Leaving Saddam Hussein in possession of weapons of mass destruction. Closed when the Turks invaded in 1974. It's now an empty postmodern shell. Uh, and uh, seeing essentially her assassins on their way. It's interesting to me that Jezebel is a sort of term, a word for a certain kind of woman. It's the kind of woman who gets out of her place. The mercenaries tried to overthrow the Seychelles government. As far as brain diseases go, syphilis is commonplace enough in 1922, particularly with veterans often in conjunction with something called PTSD. No treatment will exist for over a decade. Death by syphilis comes in many forms, either slow and painfully or what Kikongo speakers call Luftwa, sudden death. 
It was this man, Hideo Noguchi, who first discovered the causative agent of syphilis. By the early 20s, his name is synonymous with the affliction as much as with his second specialty, venom snakes. The tale of how Noguchi became involved in the science of medicine is a good one. He was born in a small village. When Hideo was just a boy, he suffered a terrible accident. An accident involving fire. Hideo's left arm, his foot, even his right hand were badly burned. No doctors lived in his village. A local, upon examining the child, is said to have remarked, the fingers of the left hand are mostly gone. Functionality would only be restored years later, thanks to a medical procedure. From this moment on, Hideo resolves to follow what he took to be his calling to help people. <laughs> Noguchi, in 1911, had infected orphan children with the disease and studied the results. This deed came back from the dead to haunt him tremendously. Science in 1922 was changing, but for years there had been no consensus regarding ethical standards in experimentation and research. Horrors were not uncommon, yet Noguchi was singled out. They say April is the cruelest month, perhaps. But Hideo dies alone, discarded by the West, and likely driven insane by the syphilis he had spent a lifetime fighting in May of 1928. Around the same time, Hideo's former employer, the Rockefeller Institute, turns their attention to applications of physics in life science, which certainly sounds more ethical than orphan child syphilis experiments. It's a relatively harmless coincidence that Rockefeller's studies in life science would one day culminate with the atomic bombs used in history's first mass terror attacks. The famous purple stuffed worm in flat jaw space with the tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 61. The wasteland makes for a good point of entry because of its many similarities to MGS-5. They both confront their respective audiences with disorienting fragments, snippets of places, people, cultures, and emotions which, when mixed up together, take on a distinctly nightmarish quality. Also in both cases, the extreme level of layering fragments and broken images together is done for a very specific purpose, to show, rather than tell, something vital about the state of the world at the time of his creation. Eliot was responding, arguably, to two major aspects of 1922. The environment of malaise and madness brought about by World War I and the burgeoning field of psychoanalytic theory pioneered by Sigmund Freud. How about Kojima? What is he responding to? <laughs> January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. MGS-5 is set in the year 1984, which signals three things right off the bat. It will respond to George Orwell's iconic dystopian novel, it will say something about the 1980s, and finally, it will say something about now in a way that links all three together. Kojima, with V, gave himself a serious challenge as a writer. Do too much, and the continuity and connections from game to game could break. Do too little, you risk the game feeling like little more than an afterthought. How could anyone make something vital and epic in its own right, which also fits the larger MGS mold with all these restrictions and limitations? The answer to this quandary explains why the Phantom Pain is, as a narrative, told in such a bizarre way. He did so by dramatically departing from standard practices of storytelling. In the novel 1984, as I said, totalitarianism has taken on a purely mental dimension. 
the citizenry have had their language tampered with, their culture, history, and set of everyday social interactions stripped clean of all but love and fear for Big Brother. For many of 1984's characters, reality simply is whatever Big Brother, as the symbolic avatar for state power and control, says that it is. What is true today could become false tomorrow. The novel's populace have been conditioned to accept these sudden changes unquestioningly. Not even thoughts are safe from the state and its division of thought crime investigation. You are outside history. In MGS5, this total form of mind control by the state is also present, but only in the case of the protagonist. Venom Snake, it seems, is a kind of a prototype for the series equivalent of Big Brother, the Patriots, and their own kind of mind control. In MGS2's version of 2009, the protagonist Raiden is a prototype for the Patriots' plan to spread their system of control. Like Raiden, Venom Snake is a prisoner throughout the game, inside the Patriots' invisible mental prison, their new kind of monster, the product of a new kind of control. Now drugs, gene therapy, and bionics boost the psychological tampering that Naked Snake underwent in the 60s and 70s. We, the players, experience the story from Venom Snake's perspective. We are a non-entity-like figure who, in every possible sense, exists as a living weapon. The point of MGS5, as with MGS2, is not to put forward yet another paranoid dystopian nightmare. The truth is much, much scarier. Find something to believe in, and find it for yourself. And when you do, pass it on to the future. Believe in what? That's your problem. Come on. Jacques Lacan, a psychoanalytic legend some have taken to calling the French Freud. Let's break what's known as the Lacanian triad down in plain English. To start, there are two basic elements at play here. There is reality, that is, out there, also known as objective facts. There is also subjectivity, in here, also called consciousness. Think of consciousness as a colored lens or window pane. Usually it shows a mostly accurate picture of outside, but the image nonetheless is altered by the hue. To put things simplistically, each of us sees reality out there from behind a colored window pane in here. With me so far? Lacan, not to mention Freud, maintain that we human beings are unique organisms by nature of what is called consciousness. Consciousness in this sense means our neat ability to somewhat distinguish the colorful glass from the objective reality seen through it. You won't see snakes or ocelots crunching physics equations or building nuclear cyclotrons, after all. Yet it would be a mistake to believe we could ever or do ever completely move from behind the glass into the big open world outside it. We are interpreters, meaning creators. That's what subjectivity is superimposing ideas from our imaginations where none objectively exist. In this sense, truth as a concept seems rather dull, doesn't it? That statue is simply a clump of matter. Our thoughts, dreams, and sensory perceptions are merely electrical activity in that pink wrinkly mush we call the brain. Truth is no fun, it seems, no fun at all. After the end of World War II, a new kind of thinking out of France split the world in two. Existentialism, it was called. Existentialism argues for a radical reevaluation of this picture. Since facts, pure facts, exist totally outside interpretation, and since to be human is to subjectively interpret that reality of facts, you might say there is a gap in the doorway to the mind. We'll never see things fully as they are, existentialism argues, simply because it would be terribly boring and dull, it would be a meaningless void. Uh, interpretation would disappear, what's true today would become false tomorrow, a schizophrenic yet fully realistic mindset devoid of dreams, passions, love, or even a sense of self would have to set in. Why would any human being want it this way? Come to think of it, wants do not even enter in. To want is to interpret as worthwhile, yes? Objective reality is totally meaningless, which strikes us human beings as totally mysterious and terrifying. We need meaning to live, pure and simple. Of course, 
matters are not as simple as turning our backs to the post-apocalypse of objective truth and pretending the colorful perspective behind the glass is in fact the reality it depicts. Since there's no objective way to interpret reality by definition, every human being is thereby faced with a fundamental choice. Choices that are as wonderful as they are terrifying. Each of us is forced, one way or the other, to choose specifically how to interpret reality. This is wonderful in the sense that it presents us with total freedom, yet it is also terrifying and even cruel, because we humans are wired by biology to seek out external validation. As interpreters, we human beings live in worlds of extreme uncertainty and fear. There's a gap between perception and reality, which means simply we can always be wrong. In a very important sense, what is meant whenever I say I does not objectively exist apart from physical, spatial, and temporal extension. Objectively, I am little more than what will one day sit inside my grave. I am something already approaching undead, the same as you. For Lacan, this objective side to human experience is the source of all terror and fear. So what do human beings do to ward off this deep existential anxiety and bleakness? Social interaction. If you're a man, you're the last man. Your kind is extinct. The Big Other refers to a kind of trade-off each human unwittingly enters very early in life. To obtain the most important thing in the world, as in external validation in the form of love, we sacrifice some of that limitless freedom. We falsely believe the security found in numbers equivocates to validity, that interpretations held to be true by many people, many minds, are more trustworthy than those held in isolation. This is a comforting illusion designed to offset our fear and anxious existence. Spoiler alert, it doesn't work, at least not fully. And worse, often it has very negative downsides. To unify with others, as infants, we begin a lifelong struggle to become just like them. We try to follow their rules, abide by their interpretations, to play the role they seem to suggest that we should. Through words and ideas, an entire universe of meanings is co-constructed between us and our image of society, and we're left right back where we started from. The Big Other is nothing more than the voice, the string of words that at this stage comes into play. The Big Other is sort of like Jiminy Cricket, your conscience, your conditioned approach and narrative uh, regarding the subjective nature of right and wrong. Though we may come to regard the individuals, mom and dad for instance, as disappointments, as failures even, the system of thought they provided us early on remain in place. It remains functioning as a sort of rule book we consult to make sense of and to interpret reality. The ideas, the symbols, and words of our social environs, the big other, remains our slave driver, our tyrant, our dictator by unconscious choice. Most of us, maybe all, choose to remain prisoners because without our doctrines and systems, we return again to the dread and despair of a meaningless reality that precludes objective interpretation. Yet again, the sense that numbers bring security asserts itself overwhelmingly strong. Lacan famously finished his account of this picture by saying, in fact, there is no big other. No Santa-like being, person, or group exists. Nobody sees you when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake. Nobody except you really knows if you've been bad or good. Nobody even knows concretely what it is to be bad or good. There is nothing that will change this basic configuration of reality. The meaning of life is subjective. We fill in its blank via imagination, via fantasies. What lies beneath that is totally devoid of objective meaning, an aspect our human minds simply cannot abide. So we fill in the gap with the best possible answers that we can in a constant flight and fight away from what seems to be an overwhelmingly terrifying truth. What is objectively true on some level is of no consequence. You know, when you make a computer program for a certain PCC-DROM gate, for example, and you construct a virtual reality, you never construct it to the end. No? For example, 
but there is no program for inside the house because simply it's presupposed in the game that you will not enter the house or you are not allowed or for example even if it's a war game where you kill each other although we, we presuppose that the persons there in cyberspace are like us but there is no program for what is beneath you know, for uh, there is no program for, they don't have really bones, blood, and so on. Why? Because this is not part of the rules of the game, Kafka put it. Or the way it's usually programmed, it is that when you do an unexpected gesture, like enter a house, then some general program is instantly activated on the spot constructing the inside of the house. So the idea we get here is that a virtual universe is in this sense a fake universe. It's not completely constructed. It's a house, but it's just externally. If you penetrate it, it's nothing. It gets fuzzy. It stops, which you can incidentally find in some early games which are still constructed in a bad way, where what you get is, uh, like, if you move too close to a human face, it's almost disgusting, embarrassing, because you see that it's only half formed, that it's not even really constructed as a face. What's the point here? What if quantum physics, when it encounters uncertainty, encounters in exactly the same way as in a uh, PC Cedron game, that the same holds for our reality? That when we approach the, this uh, quantum level, it's open, you don't know what it is, because it's the same as when you approach a house that you were not expected to, to enter. But in the same way that the PC Cedron game programmer thought, oh, people will not want to enter the house, so let's leave it like this. So God thought, people are so stupid, they will not reach to, to, to quantum level, so I don't even have to construct it to the end. That is the same ontological opening. That you see, the world is not fully constructed in itself. We, we surprised God. We did something that God in his eternal wisdom that the God didn't plan. That we will, in the same way that there is a programmer who constructed, although in an imperfect way, our virtual reality, there must be somebody who constructed real reality, God. God was also a little bit of a lazy programmer, too lazy to do all the details. Oh no, this is what is so traumatic about quantum physics. We literally cannot understand it. Not in the sense that we, common people, idiots, cannot understand it, only a couple of scientists can. Even they cannot. In what sense? In the sense that it just works. But if you try to build a consistent ontology out of it, again, you get meaningless results. You get time running backwards, you get parallel universes or whatever. In other works, you get things which simply are meaningless with regard to our ordinary notion of reality. We try so desperately to do it, which is why we try to invent metaphors to imagine quantum universe. But it cannot be done. It's too late for Lacan, since he died in the 1980s, around the time when, in the year 1984, a bright young thing named Hideo Kojima began employment at Konami Corp. Zizek does not think anyone could creatively express the ideas of Lacan are too traumatic, too alienating, too overwhelmingly devoid of meaning. They aren't so much real as they are open, the semblance of a forever blank space. A space each person fills in individually with his or her own phantasmic fantasies and pain, never to reach the top, never to find peace never to find correspondence between imagination and reality, between the symbols in our heads and the near incomprehensible, all-encompassing that defines and defies our existence. Perhaps it would be a good idea for Slavoj Žižek to play Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid V. V has come to... We can leave behind much more than just DNA. Through speech, music, literature, and movies, what we've seen, heard, felt, anger, joy, and sorrow. 
these are the things I will pass on. That's what I live for.